All right, and at this time, I'm just going to go into the word of the Lord. And we, I got the word that this is a mind. You're talking about mental health. And I personally have a, a testimony about where God brought me from when it came to my own mental health. We often um, are in church, and we don't think that um, when we serve the Lord, we just think that everything is supposed to be perfect. And I don't know why we got we got that message, right? Because one of the people that I want to talk about today is one of my favorite people. His name is David, David of the Bible. And when I look at David's life, it certainly was not perfect. <laughs> David did not have a perfect life. And sometimes we, we say, you know, Lord, I'm walking with you, and Lord, I'm serving you, and, and Lord, I don't understand. Why is it that I am going through so much? Why have I lost things? Why is it that I feel so low or I feel so down? And we forget that there really is a war and there's a battle, and the biggest battle is in our minds. And so that war and that battle, it rages, and when you love the Lord— when you love the Lord, you don't understand it. But see, God is so wise that he's given us one thing I, I like to, um, one book that I really love is the book of Psalms. He's given us the book of Psalms and the, the scriptures. It lets us know, it says that when the enemy comes in like a flood, meaning that when you're feeling overwhelmed and you feel like you're about to be overtaken, that it's got to be God that will lift up a standard, amen? And he lifted up to the point that you can withstand even when you think you are about to be overtaken and you can't take it. The scripture also lets us know that when we walk through the fire, it said you won't even be burned. Now, when we walk through the fire, we feel like we're going to get burned, but he said you will not be burned in the floods, the water. It won't overtake you. Amen. Even though you feel like it's going to overtake you, you will not be overtaken because God is a God of promises. And what he says, he does it. Amen. He does it. And sometimes you just simply got to put him to the test. How do you put God to the test? You put God to the test by trying him. You got to try him. You got to try him. And how do you try God? You get stubborn with him. You get stubborn with him. David said in the book of Psalms, he said, it's one thing. Have I desired of the Lord? That will I seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. No matter what it was that David went through, he said, it's one thing. That one thing I desire, I'm going to seek after, and that is to dwell in the house of the Lord. So when I feel down, I'm going to go to the house of the Lord still. And when I feel like I can't make it, if I could just hear God's word, I will be able to just make it. If I can't whisper, and I remember being in that place that I couldn't pray for myself. But if I could just hear the music that sang praises to the Lord, like it's as Sister Gina uh, went forth and they were, I just want you. And the other sister, I just want you. Sometimes... That's all you can do is to listen to the music and the words that come into your ear gate. And you just let God know, I just want you, Lord. I know that the battle is raging. I know that I'm going through some tests. I know that I have some trials before me, Lord. I don't even know what to do. Like David, David didn't always know what to do. David didn't know what to do. When he, when he was in different battles. The battles that he went through, David went through rejection. You know, David was rejected. I don't know if you know what it uh, feels like to be rejected, but when you feel unwanted, when you feel like other people, 
they don't want me a part of this. I'm excluded. And you feel rejected. David went through rejection. You say, when did he go through rejection? He went through rejection in the, in the book of um, uh, uh, 1 Samuel when, he was, when his father didn't call him. When the man, God called the prophet to go to the house to pick a king, but David wasn't called to the house. His own father left him out in the field. His own father didn't call him in when he knew that, there was, that this was selection time for a king because his own father didn't think that David was going to be selected as a king. His own father didn't even realize who he was. So many, when you think so many children and young people and adults, even in this day, have grown up without fathers, rejected. Why don't my daddy love me? Why is my father not here? Why? Where is he? Where is my mother? Where is the one that's supposed to love me? Rejection. David knew it, but yet God chose him. But yet God still chose David. Amen. And so when you think about the battles that David himself went through, you realize that you're not exempt just because you love the Lord. It doesn't mean that you are exempt. Let me open up the word. I'm in the word, but let me open it up. (laughs) I'm there. I am. I am there. So let's read um, the book of 1 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 14. First Samuel chapter 13, verse 14. It says, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. And then we're going to go to First Samuel chapter 16 and verse 1. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul? I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. Fill thy horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided him a king amongst his sons. Verse 3. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto him whom I name unto thee. In verse 6, And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab, and he said, Surely the Lord anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shammah to pass by. And he said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. And again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, the Lord has not chosen thee. These And Samuel said unto Jesse, are there all thy children? And he said, hmm, there remaineth yet this youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, send and fetch for him, for we will not sit down until he come hither. He was insisting on finding the right one that God called. He wasn't going to leave, right? Because he knew what God said. Go to Jesse's house, and amongst his sons, there's a chosen one. 
And then 12, it says, and then he sent and brought him in, and now he was ruddy and with all of a beauty continence and good to look to. And the Lord arise, anoint him, for this is he. Amen. His father didn't think to call him in. Rejection. Not being thought that much of. But yet, God called him. Yet God chose him to be anointed. Amen. I don't know about you, but it's a good thing when God calls you. It's a good thing when God is the one that chooses you and selects you, even when you feel rejected. Amen. There was another time. This is not the only time that David was rejected. David went to the field. The Bible tells us. Let me step back. The Bible tells us that David was a man that was after God's own heart. A man after God's, imagine that. A man after God's own heart, which means that God truly loved him. He said, look, he's special to me. When David loved God, he wasn't just a man after God's own heart, but he loved God. The Bible lets us know that when he was out in the field, that he was out in the field, he would praise God, even in the field. He would still pray in the field when he was alone. Amen. So often you, you may you feel alone. You may feel like you are alone. But you ain't alone when God is there with you. Amen. You're not alone when God is there with you. So when David, David had one moment. Where there was a war that was going on, and a lot of us learned a story about David and Goliath when we were little kids in Sunday school class. And you see that when he got ready to go to the field, his father told him, you need to take food down to your brothers. And when he showed up at the field and he heard about Goliath, David loved the Lord so much, he said, hold on, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? who's, in so many words, disrespecting my people and my God. Who is this? When you love the Lord, there's things inside of you that will make you rise up for the cause of Christ. Amen. It will make you rise up and you say, oh, no, uh -uh. We, we, we're not going to do that. We don't do this because this is contrary to our God. Amen. And David rose up and he wanted to know, and what did his brother say? They say, you, what you doing down here, David? You're just trying to cause trouble. They didn't see his heart. They didn't know that he truly had a deep down love for God. Have you ever in your life been in a place where you were misunderstood? David was misunderstood. That sometimes when you say, I didn't mean it that way. And why did that sister take it that way? Or why did that brother take what I said that way? Because he, he was misunderstood. They didn't understand that he loved, he loved God. And so in the midst of that, they, they, saw they were rejecting him again. And he goes to Saul and he tries to tell, and he goes to Saul and, and he, gets, he tries to tell him, look, I'll go to war. I'll fight. How many of you ever been in a position where you wanted to do something and somebody laughed at you? Because surely that's what happened to David. He was laughed at. And not only was he laughed at, but Saul tried to tell him how to fight the war that he had to fight. You ever been in a position where you know that God is leading you? He's directing your path. He's ordering your steps. And you go to move. As God say move, and somebody say, uh-uh, you don't do it like that. You don't move that way, or you don't wear that, or you don't do this. But God is leading your path. And God is directing you. And so we don't always understand, why is God moving us this way? Why are you moving us this way? But the scripture says that the steps of a good man are ordered by God. Amen. And so when you walk in his spirit and you're walking in his steps and in his way, people might laugh at you. Amen. They may laugh at you, but yet you have to stay with God. Amen. You have to stay with God. 
You have to have that spirit of David when he said that one thing that I desire of the Lord. It is that that I will seek after because I want to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. I don't know about you, but coming to the house of the Lord is not just about coming to a place to have fun. But it's about worshiping him. It's about acknowledging God for his goodness. The fact that he woke you up and he didn't have to wake you up. The fact that he blessed you. You have use of your limbs. Somebody don't have use of their limbs. You can see and somebody cannot see that God has done great things for you. And so our ultimate goal is to say, Lord, I want to see you in peace. I want to see your face when I close my eyes. So the one thing that I desire, that which I will seek after, that I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Hallelujah. To behold your beauty, Lord, and to inquire in your temple. What does that mean? I'm coming to learn. I want to know who you are, Lord. Why do I come to Bible study? Why am I hearing the word of God? Because I want to know you, God. I want to know your ways and your plan for me. Because the word of the Lord, if you want to know who God is, you got to hear that word. You got to know that word. Because when that word begins to get into your heart and your mind, it will change and it will shift things. It will change you. Hallelujah. It will teach you how to change your environment. Hallelujah. And it will begin to shift things in your space. Amen. So what you listen to. So I got some young people in the house today, so I'm just going to throw this out here. So if you listen to Sexy Red, what are you going to listen to? I mean, what are you going to think about? You're going to think about what Sexy Red talking about. But if you meditate on God's word, if you think about what God got to say, you're going to think about the things that God has for you in your mind. Amen. That peace. The scripture talks about how he gives us that peace that passes all understanding. You ever been in a test and you and people don't understand why she at peace? How she making it through this storm? How is it she hasn't lost her mind? Because the word of the Lord, when it gets into you and it gets into your mind and it gets into your heart, as the the song says, it says what? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Because when thy word gets into your heart and thy word gets into your mind, you want to be what God wants you to be. You want to be all that he wants you to be. And then you you can step back. And you can hear some other things. You can hear Sexy Red and say, there ain't nothing to that. You're going to know it because you'll hear the promises of God. And, 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 and let me tell you something. When you hear the promises of God, it'll, man, it'll put a smile on your face. It'll give you joy. It'll give you rest. Hallelujah. Scripture says that he is, I heard your pastor say, he's our refuge. He's our shelter in the storm. And that's what the word of God will do for you. Amen. I want to take you to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms, chapter 91. Psalms 91. It says that he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. That is one of the Psalms that we we would attribute to something that David has written because Dave, David wrote many of the Psalms. And so when you look at that, you think about, I talked about David suffered rejection. David lost, a, lost children. He lost two sons. That I could, no, he may have lost three. But David suffered the loss of children. David suffered the molestation of his daughter. David 
suffered um, betrayal when he served Saul, but Saul yet wanted to kill him. So he suffered betrayal. He suffered many things. And some of it was a result of his actions. Because we know that when he sinned, that God let him know that there was going to be a curse on his house. And so some of it was a result of his actions, but yet God still had mercy on him. That's the goodness of God. And he suffered through all those things, but yet he still loved the Lord. He repented, and he got back on track with God. Amen. So when we, when we fail God, we still get back up. He's given us the opportunity to still have access to him. And it says that he that dwelleth in a secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. And he said, I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge. He's my fortress. He's my God. And it's in him that I will trust. Your, our relationship with God has to be so solid that no matter what it is, that we understand that he's our refuge. And when you, when you say he's your refuge, when you're overwhelmed or when you go through different things in your life, when something is your refuge, you run to it and you can hide in that thing. Amen. It's your fortress. And so this is the part where I share my testimony. When I was, uh, had my son back in 2014, um, I um, went through a really tough time. I was serving God. I was a minister in my church. I was a youth leader. I was praying for people. I was doing everything I thought that I needed to be doing. When my whole world came crashing down, my family had um, transitioned to the city of Milwaukee. And at that time, I didn't know that my husband would be pastoring a church at all. And so I knew that I had just given birth to my baby. He was four months old. And um, I started getting really um, sick. And I started having really bad anxiety, really bad anxiety, to the point that I didn't know, like, if something's going to happen to my baby. And what I didn't realize is that I was suffering from a condition that people often don't hear about, especially in the African-American community. We, we don't talk about it. We don't talk about mental health in, in communities where, you know, you don't, and not even just African-American, but in poor communities where people don't have access to a lot of resources. They don't, we don't always talk about our mental health. And so I didn't understand what I was going through. But I suffered from a condition called postpartum depression psychosis. It wasn't just postpartum depression. It was, it was to the point that I was having a psychotic episode, and I didn't realize it. I didn't know it. I knew something, I knew something was wrong with me, but I didn't know what was wrong with me. And I would tell everybody, I'd say, I'm, I'm sick, I'm not feeling well. And people would be like, oh, you'll be fine, you just had a baby. It was the hormones that, from having my baby that sent me out of whack. But because this is something that I'm just, you know, I love God. There's no way. I am, th there's no way that I'm going through what I'm going through. Because I love God. And so... I had been going back and forth to the doctors, and they were testing me, my thyroid. And they're like, okay, you got this issue. I, I learned that I had a, a minor issue with my thyroid. And they said, you got this issue going on. And then they said, um, you need to see your doctor and follow up. And at that time, I'm transitioning to Milwaukee. My husband's grandmother passes away and dies. My brother had died in 2011, and I had never dealt with the grief. I just picked myself up, and I kept on moving, and I kept on going, and I just, I was always the strong one, always the one that's helping everybody else, that's doing for my family, that's doing in my church, and there when people call me, 
And I just kept on moving and I kept going. But when I got hit with postpartum depression psychosis, that was the very thing that came up in me, grief. Because I didn't deal with it at that time. You know, sometimes we think we can just pray things away, but we don't want to deal with medical professionals. We don't want to go to doctors. We don't want to be honest about the fact that we have experienced trauma or grief or sadness. And I, I was that one that was just like, I'm moving. I'm doing this. I'm superwoman. I got it together. All of it. And so it got so bad that after we moved to Milwaukee, we had to pack up our house here. We moved to Milwaukee. I'm dealing with grief. I'm dealing with this, you know, the sadness of my, my losing my brother. And I'm thinking I got this thyroid issue. I don't understand what's going on. I must be dying because my brother died suddenly. So I'm thinking I must be dying. And my mind is going crazy to the point that it's like race car tracks going over in the way that I would say that it was. It was like race car tracks. Like zoom, when you watch TV, zoom. Because I'm just, I'm about to die. And I'm trying to sleep and I'm waking up in panic attacks. And I'm having anxiety attacks. Trying to sleep. And my baby, he would cry because he, he needed me. And I would pick him up and hold him close to me because I didn't want nothing to happen to him. And maybe he was going to help me get through. It got to the point, you all, and, I, and now here, I told God, I said, Lord, I will share my testimony one day. And I usually am not this transparent, but I'm going to be transparent because I, I feel like it can help somebody. It got to the point that I went a whole month and a half and I could not sleep. I would, I, I seriously could not sleep. I would be woke, and I got to the point that I was on the couch, and my daughter, she just turned five years old, I couldn't even take her to school. I was so weak in my body. My mind was just racing, and I couldn't sleep. And I go to the doctor, and they say, you, you, you're, you're going to be fine. You just had a baby. You're tired. I got up in the middle of the night one night, and I was so out of it. I still remember it. I got out of the house. I walked out of my house. I had no shoes on. I had pajamas on. And I walked across Highway 100 in Milwaukee. You know that busy street. Without looking to make sure cars were not coming. And I made it to the other side. But I was lost. I remember it still, and I didn't know what was going on, but I remember just walking, and I was just walking, and I was just like, I didn't know what was going on. And before you know it, I eventually found myself in the hospital. And, and I kept asking myself, man, how did I get here? I was serving God. I was doing everything that I needed to be doing. How did I get here? And I felt low, and I felt attacked, and I felt ashamed because it was like, how? Like, I, I, I'm a professional, and I, I'm a mother, and I'm a preacher. And then things were not getting better for me for a while where I was struggling because I got misdiagnosed from the doctors. So the doctors were giving me me medicine that was making it worse before I got better. But how many of you know that the scripture says, and I remember saying this, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And I said, Lord, I faithfully served you, and I was going through, I'm not going to lie, but I just kept holding on to the little that I had in God, just a little that, the little bit, times that I cried, times that I would just, my husband, he was so good, he was there with me, and times that I cried, and he would have to pray for me because I couldn't pray for myself. And I felt so lonely. I was away from my family, and I was going through this storm, and I was going through this test. But God was my refuge. He walked across that street with me. He didn't allow me to get hit by a car when I could have got hit by a car. 
He was my refuge. And there were times that I just said, Lord, I got to the point, I said, Lord, I don't want to keep going through this because it was a long process for me to begin to, to try to process, Lord, why am I going through? Because I kept blaming myself. What did I do wrong? But it wasn't that I did anything wrong. It was a natural, it was a natural condition that came upon my pregnancy, me ha being pregnant and having a baby and my hormones being out of whack. But I was ashamed. And I would, you know, go to church sometimes and I just sit there and I, I just remember just going through. But in my long time, even in my long time, I got to the point, I said, Lord, I'm so tired of going through. I said, just take me. But even if you take me, even in the midst of that, even if you take me, I just want to be where you want me to be. I still want to be pleasing in your sight, God. I just want to be at peace with you, Lord. My, it's my, it was, God was still in the midst that where even when I could not, I couldn't do anything for myself. I couldn't think right. But yet, when you, let me tell you, when you go through a storm and you go through a test and you go through a trial in your life, that's to the point that you can't think. You can have a physical body, but when you can't think, but yet you still look to God, you still say, Lord, I'm hanging on by a thread. Why? Because something's got to be put in you. And that's why I go back to the word of the Lord. Why is it so important for God's word to be in you? Because when you get so low, when you get so low, when you get down and out, that's what's going to rise up in you. That is what will rise up in you. Some of our young people, we see that they go through tests and they go through trials and they, ha they haven't been taught. I even adults haven't been taught how to deal with your emotions. So then you say, well, why they hitting each other? Why they, why they shooting each other? Why they cussing each other out? Because if that's what's in you, when you get when you get and your back is up against the wall and you get in that test, in that trial, that's what's going to come up out of you. And so when you look at David, though, when Saul chased him, he prayed. He wanted to kill Saul at one time. He wanted, he was rightful, he was rightful in his anger towards Saul. To where he could have killed him and taken him out. But he thought about God and what would God want for him to do. So no matter what your test may be, no matter what your trial may be, I encourage you to try God. Put him to the test. You got to put God to the test. And let him be the one to show you he's real. Because sometimes we're struggling with our faith. Sometimes we're struggling. Is he real? Is he not? Is he going to show up? Or will he not? Does he love me? Has he forgiven me? But I encourage you to say, Lord, I ask you, I put you to the test. I'm going to be like David. I'm going to say, Lord, it's one thing. One thing I'm seeking after. One thing that I desire. I was so low that I didn't think that I could do many things again. I didn't think I could work again. That's how low I was. Going back and forth to doctors and then you got this diagnosis and then you have this diagnosis. And God's so good, he put a doctor that was a praying doctor in my path. And when he began, that doctor began to work with me. And when he began to talk to me, he not only talked medicine to me, but he talked faith to me. He helped me come back to being the Erica that I needed to be. And I just, you know, I just thank God because when I think about being in my storm, when I think about 
being in that test and that trial and being in a place that is so dark, you don't know which way to go. I can't do anything but to give God glory. I can't, I can't because nobody can take the honor of what God did for me. Amen. Nobody can take the honor. Nobody. My husband couldn't bring me out. My family couldn't bring me. They could pray for me, but they couldn't bring me out of my test and my trial. Only God could go in the storm, could come in the storm with me and to walk and to carry me through at that time in my life. Amen. I want to finish on this, um, on this note. Pastor, oh, that's 37, Psalms 37. Psalms 37. Psalms 37, verse 23 and 24. I told you I love David. And I love the Psalms that he wrote. Because a lot of those Psalms was written when he was going through. Through a test and a trial. And so you see that when he was going through, what was coming out of him. And so you read Psalms 37 and 23. And 24. It says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. And though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his right hand. Amen. It is God that orders your steps. We don't know, we don't know what tests and trials we're going to face in this life. And had God told me that that was a test that I would face, I would not have taken it. My son... He's, he's not in here. He left. But through all of that experience, people in our church will tell you how he is. He, he's rambunctious and he got a lot of energy. That's his Sunday school teacher. She knows. <laughs> but he loves God. Out of all that I went through, when I look at that little boy, my God, when I look at that little boy, and he will pray for his mom. He will tell me what's on his mind. Mom, you, you tired because you're always working. He will pray for me. He will praise God. He's a worshiper at heart. And he came out as a worshiper. He was uh, diagnosed with um, epilepsy but I believe God to be a healer and a deliverer and he and, and when I talk with him he's always talking about things of God one day I was in a house and I could hear beautiful music just going through the air. He was in his room worshiping. He was, I love you, Lord. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And I'm like, how do you know how to worship God like that? And so sometimes I say, Lord, I'm that vessel that you used and all the tests and the trials that I went through from that pregnancy with that child, even in a delivery room, from there being meconium in my system, so the doctors were concerned that he would swallow it and he could die, and then his heart dropping over and over again in the delivery room, and the doctor saying, you can't move because his baby's heart keep dropping, and we're going to prepare a space just in case something's wrong when he comes out, and him coming out perfect, and nothing wrong with him. 
you know, and I just think about that. I said, I went through all these things, but Lord, you gave me this. You gave me that baby. <laughs> you know, and he's a reminder of the tests and the trials that I went through, even in my mind. Being depressed, being down during those times, being lonely, and having nobody but God to look to. Saying, Lord, I understand that if you don't heal me, and if you don't deliver me, that was the point I was at. Lord, if you don't heal me, if you don't deliver me, I know I can't be healed and I won't be healed. And even when doctors, when I would go to the doctor, I had to pray. I got frustrated when doctors weren't listening to me. I said, oh, yeah, y'all think y'all don't need to listen to the one who was outside with no shoes on, walking across Highway 100. <laughs> I get it. I get it. But I knew I wasn't out of my mind. I knew something was going on. I wasn't acting rational. But I knew that God was going to be my refuge. I knew that it was him that I could run to. And I knew that even in that dark place, you know, so many of our young people go through things, and I have a heart for young people, and they don't have the outlet or anybody to talk to. And they'll do whatever they know they can do with a little bit that they know, you know. But I, I can sit back and honestly say, I thank God that somebody told me who God is. So then I recognize that, I don't have to just lean on my power. I don't have to lean on my understanding. Because if I just lean on my understanding, I'm not. I, I, I'm limited. But God is greater than I am. His, his power surpasses my understanding. And that if he's the creator of it all, that I don't have to just look to me because I will stop. But he doesn't. The Bible says that his mercies, it endures forever and ever and ever and ever. And so then, when I think of our young people in the position, even Madison, I'll, I'll go back. I have a heart for Madison because I grew up here. And I knew what it was to live here as a minority in particular. To live in this community in Madison could be, could be rough. And so when I heard about the killing of the young lady on the east side, my heart ached. What was put in our children or not put in our children to give them the tools that they need to care and love that much about their life, to be concerned that anger gets to that point our babies need the Lord. And I thank God that God has given me God. I mean, that God has given me people in my path who told me about who God is. Because then I can run to him. He's my refuge. He's my strength. He's my shield. And I thank you for having me today. Amen. <laughs>